Well, hello everybody. It's uh, one o'clock, so we'll get our presence, presentation started today. My name is Catherine Enright. I'm Volunteer Manager with Sydney Harbour Federation Trust. And firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians and owners of the lands and waters on which we all stand today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Welcome to our Trust Talk today, and this is via our digital platform, DigiTalks. The Harbour Trust is offering a series of these, so please be sure to check out harbourtrust.gov.au for future presentations. And also I'm happy to say we are recording this presentation and many of the others. So if you'd like to catch up later or spread the word, uh, please do so. But before introducing the presentation today, I'd just like to give a couple of tips on how best to enjoy this Zoom webinar. Our speak speaker, Sterling, will share his screen with you today and your microphones have been muted. And you should also be able to see a couple of video tiles there on your screen. I suggest that you minimize these by using the, the small line on the top of the top video and moving it to the bottom of your screen. And this way you'll be able to enjoy the presentation. If you have any technical issues throughout, please use the chat option at the bottom of your screen and we will endeavor to help you. Now, Sterling will be happy to answer questions at the end of the presentation. So if you do have a question, please use the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. And we won't be able to get to all questions. Uh, so apologies in advance if we don't get to yours. Now to our Trust Talk presentation. Our presenter, Sterling Smith, is an archaeologist with extensive experience working throughout Australia and overseas. He specialises in maritime archaeology, military and polar heritage, but has also worked extensively in Aboriginal and historical archaeology. He currently works as the Senior Maritime Archaeology Officer with Heritage New South Wales, Department of Premier and Cabinet, and is the current president of the Australian Institute for Maritime Archaeology, AMA. And today's presentation. For over 60 years, one of the great Australian wartime and maritime mysteries was the whereabouts of the third and last Japanese midget submarine, which attacked Sydney Harbour on 31st of May, 1942. It was not until November, 2006, that a group of weekend divers called No Frills Divers located the M24 midget submarine off the Bungan Head, Newport, Sydney. The wreck was immediately identified to be of national heritage significance and was listed as a protected historic shipwreck and placed on the New South Wales State Heritage Register. The M24 is seen as a unique heritage site internationally, representing one of only a handful of such submarine wreck sites located worldwide and in its original battle context. Heritage New South Wales, along with the Commonwealth and Japanese governments, has developed award-winning management strategies to protect and interpret the site. This presentation will look at the background of the M24, as well as management strategies and future management issues of this highly significant maritime archeological site. And now I hand over to our speaker, Sterling. Thank you very much, Catherine, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, I'd just like to give you a, a short presentation on the M24. I'm going to start off by doing a little bit of a background history about the attacks on Sydney Harbour. I'll then look at the M24's discovery and then look a little bit at the management of the site and then talk about where we're going with the future directions of the management. The one thing I'd like to say is this is an extremely significant part of Australia's history. There's a huge amount of information um, about the raid and the management of the submarine. And obviously I'm only gonna be able to just go over a very um, summary uh, event, a summary of the events uh, in today's talk. But I will at the end of the talk, um, give you some links where you can find further detailed information. So Japan entered World War II in December 1941 with the raid on Pearl Harbor. Now, this raid was obviously known as mainly uh, undertaken by aircraft from uh, carrier-borne um, attacks. But what was interesting about it is the Imperial Japanese Navy had also um, put five midget submarines into the attack as well. The idea was that the midget submarines would be able to work their way through the harbour defences, get into the harbour and sink uh, shipping. Unfortunately for the Japanese, the uh, submarines were all lost or destroyed, and most of them were caught in anti-submarine nets or um, depth charged by, by vessels. So from the perspective of the midget submarine raid, it wasn't particularly successful. 
However, the Japanese believe that they would still be able to use the uh, midget submarines to great success. In um, 1942, they decided to have two more um, raids, simultaneous raids by the submarine midget attack groups. So on the 29th of May 1942, three midget submarines attacked the um, Allied base at uh, Diego Suarez in Madagascar. Now, one of the submarines was able to get through and fire its two torpedoes. One of the torpedoes damaged the HMS Ramillies, and the um, other one actually sank the British Loyalty, which was a, a British tanker at the time. Simultaneously, the second attack group was actually sent off Australia, and on the 29th of May 1942, five I-class um, submarines uh, stationed themselves about nine more nautical miles off Sydney. Now, the I-class submarines were extremely large. They were around about 400 feet long. They had a crew of 144 uh, men and officers on board, and they were long-distance submarines that could carry large loads. Three of the submarines actually had uh, midget submarines attached to their outer casings or the hull casings. And you can see the image on the top right hand corner here of one of the midget subs. And two of the um, air, um, submarines were actually fitted with waterproof aircraft hangars and they both had uh, float planes in them. Now the midget submarines that were used on the raid on Sydney Harbour were the Taipei Kahayatiki class midget submarines. And this was what was also known as the improved version one. The Imperial Japanese Navy had learned some of the lessons from their attack on Pearl Harbor, mainly to do with anti-submarine net defenses. So the version one, you can see a larger cage over the torpedo tubes and another series of net cutters at the top of the conning tower. Now the submarine's main armament was two Type 97 torpedoes. It had a crew of two. It was about 78 and a half feet long and only about five and a half feet wide. So a very, very small submarine, uh, very cramped quarters for the two crew, all elect electrically driven by batteries. And these submarines were designed to be launched from motherships like the I-class submarine. They were meant to undertake their attack and then they were designed to return, to be reused, to be recharged and sent out again. So on the 29th of May, 1942, um, a 14 wide globe, uh, Glen float plane was launched from um, off Sydney. Now the idea of this was a final reconnaissance mission. They wanted to actually check what shipping was available for potentially attacking in Sydney Harbour. The Glen took off just before dawn. It actually came all the, almost over the top of Macquarie Lighthouse, went down into the lower part of the harbour, then went back up the harbour, looped down and went all the way down to Cockatoo Island where it circled around and then started its working its way back up the harbour and then back out to sea again. Now this aircraft was actually spotted by a number of people and it was actually reported as potentially being an, a, an enemy aircraft. But the uh, command at the time actually thought it was one of the seaplanes from um, the, U, the USS, um, sorry, one of the uh, USS um, airplanes and uh, mistook, mistook it for that and actually didn't think it was a Japanese aircraft at all. So the alarm wasn't raised. So Sydney Harbour in 1942 had a, a number of defences. If you look at the image on the left hand side here, you can see there were six indicator loops off the heads. Now these indicator loops were designed to pick up magnetic anomalies from a ship or a submarine as it went over the top. At the time of the raids, two of them were not operational. Two of them were giving very bad feeds and then the other two, they weren't sure if they were accurate or not, so they actually turned them off for a period of time. So the outer loops weren't very operational. Now the inner indicator loops, which is loops 11 and 12, which you can see here, were operational at the time. The other main defense of the harbor was the boom net, which is down here between, uh, you can see down here by Chowder Bay. The only problem was at this time, um, at this period of time, the boom net wasn't actually completed. So the ends hadn't been finished. So around about 8 p.m. on the 31st of May, the M27 was the first midget submarine to enter Sydney Harbour. Now it started working its way up along the Western Channel and got its way all the way up to the, the, uh, the boom defence gates. Unfortunately for the submarine, it actually ran into one of the channel markers then reversed itself out and its propellers got entangled in the boom defence nets. Now as it did this, the submarine actually came to the surface and it was spotted by a maritime services watchman. Uh, 
Now this watchman decided he better go and have a look and see what this was. So he got in his rowboat, went out, and fair enough, he saw a submarine, came back and immediately reported it. Now the Naval Command at the time was very skeptical this was actually a, an enemy submarine. So they actually sent out a couple of patrol boats to have a look at it. One of the patrol boats, HMAS Lolita, actually reported back it was actually a baby submarine and that they were going to attack it with depth charges. The Lolita actually dropped two depth charges, but because the water was so shallow, the hydrostatic fuses didn't go off and the, the, uh, the depth charges didn't detonate. By this time, it, it was realised that these were actually submarines and more patrol boats were sent out to investigate. But by 1037, the crew of the M27 had actually decided that the game was basically up. There was no way that they were going to be able to escape. And what they did is they actually set off their demolition charges. Now, each of the submarines had a, a scuttling charge inside it. The idea being if the submarine was going to be captured, you could destroy it so as the enemy couldn't get hold of it. The crew of the M20 decide, uh, M27 decided that they would detonate their, their charges and actually kill themselves in the process. At 9.48, the M24, which is a submarine, enters Sydney Harbour. Now, the M24 was able to work its way up past the boom defence and started heading up towards um, Garden Island. Now, the main target for the submarines was the uh, heavy cruiser, the USS Chicago, and also um, the HMAS Canberra, which was the Australian vessel up there at the time. Now, the M24 was spotted as it went past Chicago, and in fact, the Chicago's guns were brought to bear and they opened fire on the submarine. The problem that they had is the submarine was very low in the water and they couldn't depress their guns far enough to, to fire at it effectively. They did fire their five, five inch guns a few times. And in fact, one of the rounds actually hit the Martello Tower on Fort Denison. The M24 then disappeared from view and basically it worked its way around to the stern of the Chicago where it could get a good, uh, a good aim and fire its torpedoes, which is exactly what it did. The first torpedo was fired and it actually went down the port side of Chicago, narrowly, narrowly missing, missing it, um, and then ending up hitting the seawall on Garden Island. It unfortunately exploded underneath the HMS Cuttable, which was a uh, ex-ferry that was being used as an accommodation block at the time and exploded and uh, destroyed the Cuttable almost instantly. The second torpedo was fired, went down the starboard side of the Chicago, also missing it, but it went up onto the seawall at Garden Island and didn't explode. And if you look at the screen in front of you, you can see the top image is the torpedo that didn't explode. But the bottom one is actually the torpedo that blew up HMS Cuttable, and that's currently on display at the Royal Australian Navy um, Heritage Centre at Garden Island. And if you haven't been down there, I'd recommend going down and having a look at it. So HMS Cuttable was destroyed by uh, the M24's torpedo. Um, as I said, it caused a huge amount of damage. It killed uh, 21 Allied uh, naval personnel, 19 of them were Australian and two British personnel. It also heavily damaged the K-9 submarine, which was a Dutch submarine that was moored alongside the wharf. Now the K-9 wasn't destroyed, but it was so severely damaged it put it out of service for a number of years. And the K-9 eventually was decommissioned from the Dutch Navy and brought into the Australian Navy. It didn't have a very successful career, unfortunately. By the end of the war, it was scrapped. Um, it was actually towed up the, the coast of New South Wales and lost in 1944 in a storm and run ashore. And the remains of the K-9 submarine is still buried in the sand at uh, Seal Rocks today and it sometimes gets, ex gets exposed as well. So at 3.01 a.m. on the 1st of June, the M22, the final and third submarine, enters Sydney Harbour. By this stage, the harbour is on high alert. Um, there's patrol boats everywhere. Everyone's looking for the submarines. So by the time the N22 comes into the harbour, um, everyone is looking for it. It's uh, discovered near Taylor's Bay and it's heavily depth charged. The crew realising that there was no escape decided instead of surrendering, they would actually commit suicide and the two crew uh, shot themselves with the officer's pistol. At 1am, on the 1st of June, the M24 crosses indicator loop number 11, which is on the outside of the harbour, and disappears for 64 years. Now, at this time, when it went over the indicator loop, there was some confusion. 
um, people actually thought it was a fourth submarine entering the harbour. And so for many years, there was believed that there may have actually been a fourth submarine that was involved in the attack. But later analysis, we realised it was actually the M24 uh, heading its way out of the harbour, not to be seen again until 2006. So the aftermath of the attack, we had the M27 worked its way as far as the boom net defences um, at Taylor's Bay and uh, destroys itself by setting off its scuttling charges. The M22 was depth charged uh, at Taylor's Bay and the crew committed suicide there. The M24 fires both its torpedoes, the only submarine to have actually fired any torpedoes in the raid, one of which destroyed the cuttable, killing 21 crew on board. The M27 then works its way out of the harbour and heads north. So for approximately two days, uh, the three I-class submarines uh, sat off Pitwater, waiting for the return of the midget submarines, which never happened. Um, by the 8th of June, they'd moved on to what their secondary missions were, which is basically disrupting Allied shipping up and down the east coast of Australia. On the 8th of June, the I-24 surfaced off of Sydney, um, and the crew was to, uh, ordered to actually bring their deck gun to bear. Apparently they were aiming for um, the Sydney Harbour Bridge at the time, but they fired 10 shells into Sydney and only one of them detonated. Now when the M20, uh, the I-24 uh, started its raid, the Air Force scrambled a couple of aircraft, um, one of which was First Lieutenant George Leo Cantello. He was with the US Air Force. Um, he immediately took off in an Air Cobra, but unfortunately his aircraft had a catastrophic engine failure and the aircraft crashed almost immediately. And if you have a look on the bottom right hand corner here, you'll see there's a small commemorative plaque at Liverpool um, to uh, George Cantello. The other thing to mention is the, uh, the shelling of Sydney was not successful for a couple of reasons. Obviously, it was very rushed. They, they wanted to uh, submerge and get out of enemy fire potentially as fast as possible. But the main reason was the shells that they were using were armoured piercing rounds. These were designed to shoot at very heavily armoured ships. Now, when they were fired at Sydney, they were you know, hitting things like concrete walls and things like that, the shells basically just went straight through them and didn't even detonate, so it caused very little damage. And there was only a couple of minor injuries as well. Probably the, one of the greatest uh, examples of the, the damage that was done was the corner store on Small and Fletcher Street in Wallara. And if you have a look at the images on the screen, you can see on the right hand side some of the damage that was done to the, the store. And on the left hand side, you can see that that building still remains there today. And actually, there's an interpretive plaque uh, on the ground there to show the impact point of where the shell hit. Also, on the 8th of June, the I 21. Um, uh, shelled Newcastle. Again, it uh, came up and they used their deck gun. Apparently the, the target at that time was the BHP Steelworks. Again, very little damage. Uh, one, of the, one of the shells landed in the water. Most of them didn't cause any great damage at all, predominantly because they were the armoured piercing rounds and not designed to, to do a great deal of damage. Um, but the interesting thing is uh, when it opened fire, Fort Scratchley at Newcastle actually um, became the only Australian coastal fortification to fire on an enemy ship in World War II. Um, unfortunately, the submarine is submerged by that stage, but uh, it's interesting that Scratchley was able to actually bring its guns, guns to bear and actually fire on the I-21. The submarines then continued their campaign up the east coast. The Iron Chief was torpedoed by the I-24, the Iron Crown was torpedoed by the I-27 and there was loss of life on both of those ships. But the I-21 torpedoed the SS Guatemala, um, but fortunately all the crew were able to get off with any without any loss of life. So what's the post-attack analysis? Um, predominantly the, the raid was considered to be not incredibly successful. Um, it, had, it had sunk a naval ship. It caused obviously the death of 21 sailors. Um, the shelling operations, again, hadn't really caused a huge amount of damage, but it was the psychological uh, impact, I think, that was probably the, the most successful part of the raid. It had caused a great deal of concern. Um, a huge amount of manpower and resources was then having to be put into anti-submarine operations off the East Coast. So, 
certainly for material impact, it wasn't a great success, but for, certainly from a perspective of you know, concerning and tying up resources, that was, it was uh, obviously much more of a success for, from that point of view. The submarine crew that were recovered from the M22 and the M27 um, were taken to Rookwood Cemetery and their remains were cremated. And they were actually given full military honours. Uh, the Japanese flag was um, draped over the, the coffins and they were given a 21 gun salute. The ashes from the submariners were actually returned to Japan through diplomatic channels during the war. Now this caused a great deal of concern. Uh, Rear Admiral Muirhead uh, McGould had actually decided that he would give um, the crew of the submarines these honours. One, for their bravery. They were obviously very brave in their attack. But two, it was also felt that if we showed the Japanese um, that we treated their, their dead with respect, that the Japanese may treat Australian prisoners of war in Singapore with a similar sort of respect. Unfortunately, um, when the news got back to Japan, it was used very much for propaganda purposes. So after the, the submarine attack, um, full military honours to this extent was never extended to, uh, to foreign, uh, foreign soldiers or um, submariners ever again. So the submarines themselves, the M22 and the M27, um, they were actually recovered from the harbour within a couple of days of the attack. Uh, they were analysis, analysis, analysis was undertaken of them. And then they were actually sent um, around New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia on a relief fund. The Royal Australian Navy Relief Fund and the King George Fund for Merchant Sailors was set up. And the submarines were put on tour where people could pay uh, to come and inspect them and have a look at them and buy war bonds and things like that. You could also buy souvenirs that were made from the submarines. If you see the image on the bo bottom right hand corner, it's a, a little lead model midget submarine and that was made from some of the lead cells from the batteries of the submarines themselves. In 1950, the remains of the M22, the uh, M27 were sent to the Australian War Memorial and if you go to the memorial today, you'll see the remains of basically the two submarines that were put together in the Anzac Hall. The submarine you see there is, is not one, it's actually made up of the two. The conning tower section from the 20, M27 is what you can see there and the bow section from the M22. Now the actual conning tower section of the M22 is on display in Sydney at the Royal Australian Naval Heritage Centre in Garden Island. And if you haven't been there, I'd highly recommend going, having a look, they have a great collection and a lot of it's dedicated to the attacks uh, in 1942. But the other thing I'd recommend is actually go and have a look at the conning tower section of the midget sub. You'll get an appreciation of just how small it is. Um, the crews were actually selected for these operations for their stature. It was felt that if you were smaller, obviously you'd fit better into the submarines. But when you have a look inside, you'll see just how tiny the operating space was for these two crew. So the M24 became a mystery for 64 years. Um, everybody wondered where it had disappeared to. There were dozens of uh, suspected cases of finding it. People believed that they'd actually found the submarine on numerous occasions. But it wasn't until the 12th of November 2006 that a group of recreational divers from the northern beaches in Sydney found the M24. And this group was called the No Frills Divers. And basically they would go out on the weekends uh, and they would use echo sounders to find little bumps and things on the seafloor. They would then dive on them and, and see what they were. And on the 12th of November, they hit the jackpot. They found the M24 virtually intact, sitting upright on the seafloor. It's in 56 meters of water. And it was virtually intact, apart from the fact that it was covered in uh, a large number of trawler nets. And we do believe at some stage, um, trawlers may have snagged the submarine and actually rolled it over. And it did cause some damage to the conning tower, removing the anti-submarine um, nets on the anti-submarine cutters on the top, and also the uh, cutters on the base section. But apart from that, it was in extremely good condition. So it was located about five kilometres or three nautical miles off uh, Bungan Head. And like I said, it's in about 56 metres of water. So it's actually quite, quite a deep site. On the 1st of December, obviously, um, the discovery of the submarine meant it was a highly significant part of our maritime history. Um, the New South, and New South Wales and Commonwealth governments immediately moved to protect the site. Um, the site was declared an historic shipwreck and a 500 metre exclusion zone was immediately put round it. It was also um, 
noted for its significance and listed on the New South Wales State Heritage Register. Now, the idea of the protection zone was to enable the archaeological surveys to take place. It was also designed to give us an idea of an understanding of what condition it was in. Was there any threats from unexploded ordnance? And also, were the two crews still on, on board the site? So to enforce this exclusion zone, uh, you can see on the screen here, this uh, yellow boy was put on site, one to designate where the site was and you couldn't come near it, but also there was a, a, a motion detected camera that was actually put on, on the site itself. The idea being that if anyone came in and tried to get into the, the protected zone, the camera would go off and the information and images were sent straight back to Heritage New South Wales and also the New South Wales Water Police. We also had a land-based video camera and it's a 24-hour monitoring system to ensure that nobody goes into the protected zone. So the preliminary archaeological surveys, um, like I said earlier, the site's very deep. It's 56 metres, so it's well below, well below the recreational dive limit. Unfortunately, it also means that it's below the limits that we are allowed to dive to. Um, at Heritage New South Wales, we're, we're under the commercial dive codes, but we're restricted to just over 30 metres. So unfortunately, we couldn't actually examine the site ourselves. So the preliminary assessment was actually uh, done by the Royal Australian Navy. The clearance diving teams went down and inspected it, and they actually used um, their remotely operated vehicles, which you can see on the screen here, being the little yellow submersible up on the top right hand corner, to do the first surveys of the site. One of the things we wanted to first of all understand is, was this actually the M24? So the first thing was actually looking for diagnostic features. What actually would tell us that this was the M24 and not some other submarine? As I said earlier, there was some belief that there was actually a fourth submarine, even though that was never really confirmed. Um, we wanted to first of all understand what this site was. And probably the two first things that was the most obvious was, is this submarine had the version one updates on it. So it had the net cutters, which you can see on the screen here. And on the bottom, you can actually see the net cutters being displaced off the M24 and is currently on the seafloor. But that was one feature. Also, we wanted to look at the torpedoes. As I said earlier, the M24 was the only one to actually launch its two torpedoes. So both of these torpedoes were, were obviously been fired, the torpedo tubes were empty, and this submarine had the same characteristics. So we were pretty certain that this was in fact the M24. Another thing that we wanted to understand is, were the crew still inside the submarine? Um, one of the initial uh, surveys was actually to put a camera down inside through the, the conning tower hatch. Then you can see here the image on the bottom right hand corner, the, the hatch has actually been displaced and is on the seafloor, but it was a lot of sand and sediment inside. So one of the first jobs was to actually put the video camera down and see what we could find. What we did find was that the access ladder, which you can see here, is actually still in the upright or stowed position. Now this made it clear that the crew were in fact still inside. If they, would have had, if they were able to leave the submarine, they would have had to go up this access hatch and the ladder would be in the, downward, in the downward position. So we know that the crew of the M24 are still in, entombed inside it. The other thing we wanted to know was, was what was the site conditions like? Once we realised that the crew was still inside, we obviously wanted to make sure that they, you know, that their remains weren't visible or in, and, and, and under any threat. So video camera inspections were undertaken on the inside. What they revealed was that the submarine is essentially filled up with silt and sand. So the remains of the crew are essentially entombed inside. We also wanted to know, uh, was there any unexploded ordnance still on the site? And what the general condition of the hull and um, the actual fabric of the submarine was, was like, what its condition was, uh, was it actively corroding or, or was it you know, fairly stable? The other thing I think was really important that everyone realised at the very beginning of this, once the submarine was found, this is not only a shipwreck, it's not only the physical remains, it's actually the the last resting place of the, the two crew who are on board. Um, Sub-Lieutenant Ban and Petty Officer Ashibe's remains are still in tombs inside the wreck. And I think it was important to understand that when we were undertaking this work and doing these surveys, that we wanted to be respectful uh, and obviously uh, acknowledge that it is the final resting place of, of these two submariners. We also had a, a number of uh, ceremonial events that took place on, on board above the submarine. In 2008, 
the Royal Australian Navy actually undertook a, a dive on the site um, and they recovered sand and sediment from around the, uh, the submarine itself. Now this um, sediment was then sent back to the families and they actually had it so as they could put it into the shrines, uh, the family shrines to the, the submariners. Also in 2013 we had Dr Jinjitsu Sen who actually came out and performed a traditional um, Japanese tea ceremony. Now Dr Sen himself was an actu actually a um, Imperial Japanese uh, Air Force pilot during the war and he came and gave the ceremony and actually lowered down uh, traditional sake in a bowl as an offering to the site and to the, to the two submariners. He'd actually performed a, a similar ceremony above the USS Arizona in Pearl Harbor as well. And I think it's important to also um, point out that it was a ceremony for the, obviously the crew of the M24, but I think Dr. Sen was very clear and also saying it was a ceremony of healing for all the men and all the crews that were lost uh, during the campaign. The detailed, detailed archaeological surveys uh, have been ongoing. As I said earlier, it's a very deep site, so we've been very fortunate in getting assistance from another a number of agencies to undertake the, uh, the survey reports. So we've had assistance from the Royal Australian Navy, Defence Maritime Services, New South Wales Water Police, who actually took site for the, uh, the tea ceremony, uh, Sydney Ports Corporation and commercial survey and dive companies. And I suppose at the end of the, the initial archaeological survey projects, we were able to um, produce the M24 archaeological survey report, which is available on our web page, which I'd recommend having a look if you're interested in, in further information about the site. We've also been uh, very uh, fortunate. The Navy's been able to help us on a, a number of times. They've also been very good in uh, supplying us, helping us with doing continued survey work by uh, allowing us to use some of their mine hunters. In 2016, we went out with uh, HMS Diamond Team, which was fantastic because they were able to use their, their advanced sonar equipment to do some survey work for us. But they were also able to put down their remotely operated vehicle and uh, take some more video footage for us as well. So the Navy's been of great assistance. So what's the results of the initial term um, and inspections and archaeological reports? Well, we actually produced uh, an M24 web exhibition, which is available through our Heritage New South Wales webpage, which you can see on the left here. And that's been a fantastic tool for us to get the information out to the public and disseminate the information of the archaeological surveys. It has uh, a very in-depth um, analysis of the raids. It also talks about the management strategies that we've employed. The other thing is that um, Heritage New South Wales and also the um, uh, also the Commonwealth governments were rewarded, I suppose, for the work that we've been doing on the M24 by a UNESCO award. In 2009, uh, UNESCO actually gave award for the management and protection of the M24 midget submarine, which is the award you can see on the right hand side there. There's also a number of interpreted plaques that have been put up. Um, there's uh, one down at uh, Middlehead that talks about the boom defences and the Japanese raid on, on Sydney Harbour. But there's also a very large plaque that we um, put in place with the Navy and the Council at Mona Vale. And this is the closest spot to the last resting place of the M24. Um, it was a very moving event. Uh, we had lots of representatives from the Navy and families. But it was also uh, lovely that we were able to have a Catalina flying boat uh, do a ceremonial flight past uh, when the uh, sun veiled as well. And I chance to, to go up to Mona Vale and have a look at the plaque and you'll be able to look straight out and see where the uh, M24's final resting place is. Another important um, part of our uh, research and archaeological work has been understanding the unexploded ordnance or potential for unexploded ordnance on the M24. Like I mentioned, the uh, midget subs all carried a scuttling charge. Um, now, for whatever reason, the M24 crew did not um, set their scuttling charge off. And we believe the reason for that was when they were heading north, it was the early hours of the morning. It was actually probably daylight by the time they got to uh, off Bungan Head. The submarine's batteries were probably just about exhausted. Um, the crew was also probably running out of air. And they decided for whatever reason um, that they put the submarine onto the seafloor. Now, many people have asked, why didn't they blow, blow it up like the uh, crew of the M22 had? 
it's probably something to do with the fact that it was daylight at that stage. They were trying to get their way back to the uh, the I-class mother submarines, had set those scuttling charges off. They would have alerted the Allies to their position and to uh, looking for the, the mother submarines as well. So it's, that's probably the reason why they decided not to set off those scuttling charges. But from an archaeological point of view, it, it makes it interesting for us um, because we have to understand if those um, scuttling charges were still on board. So the Unexploded Ordnance Survey, which was um, undertaken by Dr. Brad Duncan and Smith from our office, identified that the scuttling charges are still on the M24. But after this period of time, it's most likely that um, salt water ingresses got into them and made them uh, uh, not live, but we can never, you know, definitively say that there's, uh, you know, no chance of unexploded ordnance on the site. And this is managing a site like this, and particularly when it comes to visitation of the site. Obviously, from a heritage perspective, we want the submarine to be left uh, alone. We want the people to look at it, but don't touch understand that there is potential for an exploded ordnance on site so anyone visiting it um, obviously needs to be aware that there's the potential for an exploded ordnance on here. Now we also have a, an inspection uh, regime that's going, uh, continues to go to this day. Um, every year we have a, a video and dive inspection done on the submarine. The idea is we want to record uh, how the submarine holds up over time. Is it deteriorating? Is it changing? We do a full video inspection and a diver inspection of the sub every 12 months. As part of that uh, inspection, we also do uh, what's known as a um, cathodic protection program. So on the top right hand corner here, you can see um, the submarine actually has an anode on it basically a big large um, block of zinc and it's connected to the submarine. Now the idea is that the zinc uh, actually corrodes in preference to the, so the, the anode will actually corrode. We're trying to ensure that the uh, steel stays in as good a condition as possible for a longest, uh, the longest period as possible. So anodes have to be replaced every month as well. And on the bottom left hand corner here, you can see that there's um, a corrosion potential survey being undertaken. So we monitor how the submarine is, uh, what, what it uh, and that's also part of our ongoing inspection program as well. Um, now, since the submarine was first found in 2006, there's actually been a, a moratorium on diving. Now, only archaeological and research uh, diving has been allowed to take place. There hasn't been any private diving allowed onto, onto the site. To get into that protection, you actually have to have a permit uh, from, from Heritage New South Wales, and that's been archaeological surveys. In 2017, we were approached by explorers um, of the, uh, deep sea dive, use compressed air, they actually use rebreathing to you know, very 60, you know, 56 metres is, is not a great depth for them. We wanted to actually get a, um, a program undertaken where we could do some 3D recording of the site. The Explorers Club um, actually said that they would be able to do it. Um, so we gave them a permit and you can see the images on the left, on the bottom of the screen here. This is part of the survey work that they undertook. They actually used um, scooters with cameras mounted to them and they could go up and down the submarine uh, taking images. Now these still images were then put into a program called Agisoft Photoscan, which actually produces uh, a 3D model of the site. The reasons that we wanted a 3D model was that we wanted to see what the site looked like, how it's changing over time. But the other really important thing was this is a deep site that not many people can get to. So the best way that we thought we could uh, allow the public to see it was producing 3D models that we could then put online for people to actually look at. And so this is a result of that 3D um, image work. So this is an animation that was done from the, uh, the dives done by the Explorers Club. And I'll just play it for you now. So this gives you an idea of what the submarine looks like. It gives you fantastic resolution. You can see the conning tower sitting upright. Um, you can still see the stern, look at the pillars, 
and as it comes around, you'll be able to see the top torpedo tube, which is empty. The one thing that you'll notice, there's a break in the hull just behind the conning tower there, which you can see in that image. That's actually corrosion. So there are, um, there's actually an opening there. And in that particular spot, you can actually see inside to the battery compartments. Now, this is just another animation. This is sort of the, the diver's eye view um, going down the starboard side of the submarine. You can see that corrosion hole I mentioned in the conning tower. You'll come around the bay section and you can see the torpedo tubes. Unfortunately, it doesn't show it very clearly, but there's actually a Wobbegong shark sitting in there at the time. And you can actually note all the, the marks and um, features you can see along the hull. So it gives you a fantastic idea of what the submarine actually looks like uh, while it's sitting on the sea floor. Another thing that we've been exploring since the submarine was first found was actually um, public visitation to the site. Now, obviously, this is uh, it's, it's a grave of the two submariners. We obviously wanted to be very respectful. We wanted to make it uh, sure it's safe to do so. But since the submarine was first found, we've been exploring options of actually allowing very limited uh, diver access to the submarine. And after six years of negotiation between the Commonwealth, New South Wales and Japanese governments, in 2017, we decided to ride, uh, operate a trial diver program. Now, this was a very uh, restricted uh, access program. Um, we decided to give 12 permits for divers to go onto the submarine with very strict conditions of no touch, no interference. Um, to be fair and equitable, we decided to run a ballot system where people could put in um, for the permits and we weren't really sure how many people would have applied for it. It was an Australian wide ballot and for the 12 positions we had 301 applications to actually um, undertake the dive so it was very very well received. In December 2017, the divers on the initial trial went down onto the submarine. Um, we had extremely good feedback. Everyone uh, was very respectful of the site and was very um, cognizant of the um, don't touch and leave the submarine of policies. What I'd very quickly like to do though is to just show you, this is a very short video of one of the divers after he came back from the dive on the M24. And I think Richard, encapsulates what we were trying to actually achieve with it and I think he he eloquently puts um, what the day meant to him as well so I'll just play this very quickly for everyone. Hi my name is Richard Nichols I've just had the most amazing experience diving on the Japanese mini sub. First of all we're super lucky today as you may be able to see behind me conditions are fantastic there's virtually no swell amazing visibility. What a great experience to be able to dive on, the, on, a, on a part of history. One of the great joys, I think, of diving is being able to you know, go back into the past. And it was a terrific experience there today. Great fun. Also, you know, tinged with a little bit of sadness because at the end of the day, unfortunately, you know, we've got two, uh, two brave men. Even though they were fighting for an opposing side, you've got two brave men who are entombed within the, uh, the mini sub itself. But what a great experience just to see it, the fish life, you know, it's a great little uh, site now, all those fish all over it. And really, from a, from a tragedy, um, you know, it's come a great new life. So, thank you very much. I think I think Richard was very uh, very eloquent in the way he put you know that it's from tragedy comes great new life and I think that was one of the great things that we got out of this trial event. We also found that people were very keen to have respectful visitation of the submarine and also felt very privileged that they could do so. So since that time in 2017, um, we're looking at maybe extending the diver program to allow uh, recreational divers to visit the site under very controlled uh, conditions. And to do that, we've actually um, gone back to the Japanese government and we've actually said that we'd like to operate a diver program um, with very restricted access and what they have done is they've actually gone back to the families of the M24's crew and they've actually put the proposal to them so we're still waiting to hear at the moment what uh, what their their thought on that is but we would like to feel that with the approval of the, the families we could open up the site uh, to very controlled um, diver visitation and allow people to actually experience this absolutely amazing part of our heritage. I'm really mindful of time. Um, 
what I'll do is I'll just put up on the, the, the page here in front of you. There's a couple of links if people want more information. The top link is um, our, our M24 web exhibition, which I'd highly recommend people have a look at. We also have under that is the link to our uh, Maritime Heritage Program. And under that is the New South Wales State Heritage Register listing for the M24, which has a huge amount of information on it as well. And just on that, I will also say that uh, my director, Tim Smith, who's been involved with this site since it was found in 2006, is actually doing a um, eight part podcast series at the moment. Um, and it'll have a huge amount of information on that. We hope to have that information on our webpage in the next couple of weeks. And I might see if I can maybe send it to Catherine to distribute to people as well, so as they could also have a look at that. So I'll maybe just stop there to allow some time for questions. Okay. Well, Sterling, thank you so much for that presentation. That was fascinating, especially I think the 3D, um, the 3D video was amazing. So thank you so much. Now we just have some time for some questions. Oh, the first question is, pardon my ignorance, what is an indicator loop? <laughs> sure, yeah, look, I probably, it's, it's very hard to go into to detail in such a small period of time. Essentially, there were copper wires, insulated copper wires that were put under underwater. The idea is once you put a, a um, electrical field through them, any ferrous metal object that goes over the top of it interrupts that magnetic field. And so it gives you an indication. Um, Ships could get around that by degaussing, which was reducing their magnetic signature. They weren't particularly accurate, but they were a good uh, potential indicator of, of something moving over the top of them, be that a ship or be that a, a submarine. But like I said, unfortunately, the, the indicator loops off of Sydney, you know, certainly the outer loops, weren't particularly um, accurate, and a lot of them were not actually even turned on at the time of the raid. Okay, now, do you think the two crew could ever be removed? Um, look, it's certainly something we wouldn't want to entertain at the moment. Like I said, their remains are, are very well entombed inside. I think the families have also you know, said that they would like their remains to stay there, and I completely understand that. Um, if, you know, down the track, if there was any, you know, if, if the submarine broke open, obviously we would have to look in conjunction with the Japanese and the families about the remains and what would be done with them. But essentially the submarine is their grave site. Uh, their, their remains are very well protected inside. And I think for the moment, we would certainly not want to disturb them. We would certainly want to leave their remains. And that's been the, the wishes of the family as well. Okay. Uh, Sterling, how did they recharge their batteries? Um, they, they can be done in two different ways. They, they're actually meant to go back to the mother submarines. So um, some people uh, sort of called them, you know, suicide vessels. They, they certainly weren't. These were designed to be reused. They were designed to return to the, 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 uh, the mother submarine. They could be charged from the submarines themselves and then put back into service, or they could be brought back to shore and actually recharged as well. Okay. And do we know what happened to the mother submarine? Uh, yes, uh, no, the, the interesting thing is um, pretty much all, well, all of the major vessels that were involved in this campaign didn't see it to the end of the war. The USS Chicago, all the I-class submarines, all the midget submarines, HMS Canberra, they were all actually lost during the Second World War. So all the I-classes were, were sunk um, before the end of the war. Okay. And has there been any illegal souvenir salvaging from the site? Certainly not that we're aware of, uh, and that's why we have that, that monitoring system. We have a 24-hour camera system on, on the site. Um, so certainly nothing that we are aware of, and, and we'd certainly discourage it. And I would also add that there's over a million dollar fine if someone's actually caught interfering with the site. So there's very severe penalties under the Commonwealth uh, Underwater Cultural Heritage Act, and on, also under our New South Wales Heritage Act. So under our Heritage Act, it's up to a $1.1 million fine for interfering with the site. So if anyone was caught doing it, um, it's, there would be um, hefty legal consequences. Okay. Uh, now, I think we might just have room for one more question, and that is why is the uh, Centello plaque at Liverpool? Um, the, the crash site for the um, the air crater was not far from there. He took off and he, he basically, now there's a little bit of controversy over this because apparently he was ordered not to take off. Um,
a few Wednesdays up until the end of but the present 